the final presentation for today is going to be very much in the spirit of uniting different technologies for proteomics and thinking what we can learn from one technology and combine it with another technology. And this is a fun discussion that I've had now for quite some time with Mike McCoss and colleagues. And Mike McCoss was supposed to be here today and uh, share with you our thoughts, but he couldn't make it in person. And we decided that and he certainly felt strongly that it's much better to have this presented in person. And here I am uh, sharing with you our thoughts on what single molecule proteomics might be able to learn from mass spectrometry proteomics. So I think I need to click with the mouse to start sharing. And of course, it's a very exciting time for single molecule methods. A variety of different methods being introduced. Uh, one approach is single molecule Edmund degradation. Other approaches use various uh, affinity reagents to recognize uh, 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 peptides and proteins at the single molecule level. And of course, there is a whole array of methods such as nanopore sequencing and generally sequencing by transit uh, methods. And we think that's exciting because these methods are going to have different strengths and weaknesses and they can complement existing more mature approaches based on mass spectrometry. And I think part of the enthusiasm for these methods is the thinking that because they work at the single molecule level, they can confer to proteomics some of the benefits that single molecule DNA sequencing approaches have conferred to genomics and transcriptomics, such as Illumina sequencing. For some reason, the clicker is not working. Let me just take the mouse. And I think that we are going to, while at the moment, much of this work is still limited to analyzing relatively simple mixtures of synthetic peptides, I have high confidence that the variety of existing approaches are going to mature and we are going to get to the point of being able to determine the sequences of single molecules, one molecule at a time, and from very complex mixtures. And then the next question becomes, can we scale these methods to the proteome of a human cell. And there could be applications that don't require scaling to the proteome of a human cell. But for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to share with you our thoughts on how do you scale this to quantify the proteome of a single human cell? And then how do you scale to, to many thousands of human cells? And the obvious thing to confront is this challenge that the human proteome has billions of protein molecules in a single cell. And even if you stack up all the RNA molecules, including the ribosomal RNA in the mix, there are substantially fewer molecules. And the same, by the way, applies to the genome. If you count the number of nucleotides in the human genome compared to the number of amino acids in the proteome, the genome's tiny. Proteome is just this humongous thing. And I'm going to put it on a log scale so that we can look at it more clearly. Uh, and this part of the distribution here, this tail is challenged for every single type of proteomics approach, whether that uses affinity reagents such as antibodies, an antibody that has a million fold higher affinity for its cognate target has high probability of binding to these highly abundant proteins. Again, even if it has a million fold preference for its cognate target, the binding to those very highly abundant proteins can actually exceed the binding to the cognate target. The same thing applies to proteomics, mass spectrometry based proteomics. This very wide dynamic range has been challenging and that's why it's difficult to quantify the proteome of, of a single mammalian cell because some proteins are present in million copies per cell and some are present at very low copy number. So we have a scaling factor of about 30,000 to overcome. And earlier this year, I estimated what is the number of 
peptide or protein molecules that we need to count to be able to quantify the proteome of a typical human cell. And these are the results of my estimates. And my estimates assume best case scenario, very favorable conditions. So if every single read that we count is perfect, we can map it to the proteome and we, all the computation works, we get to the conclusion that to sample the, the proteome, we need to count order billions of copies per uh, single cell. The flip side of all this high abundance of the proteome, which is a silver lining, is that we can actually do robust, reliable quantification because instead of counting a couple of copies per transcript, we can get hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of copies per protein to estimate the abundance. And this is good if one is interested in doing quantification. So what are the options? How do we go forward with, with this approach? One is, well, let's brute force it. Maybe we can come up with a way that can count at a reasonable cost billions of molecules per sample. And the other approach is, well, maybe we can sample a subset of the protein molecules so that even without counting billions of copies, we can still get reasonable estimates. Maybe we don't need to count all 10 million copies of each ribosomal protein in a cell or 2 billion. Uh, just count enough. We still want to count, but maybe count thousands rather than millions. And one obvious solution that comes to mind, having worked in the field of um, uh, mass spectrometry is to separate, to use separation, high performance separation, and then be able to count large number of copies from each analyte of interest, but not millions. And in mass spectrometry, there is this concept of automatic gain control that many of you are familiar with it, but for, for the benefit of uh, colleagues outside of the mass spectrometry field, I'll just quickly summarize the core idea. And the idea is that if we have peaks of different abundance, looting from the chromatography when they're very abundant, we sample them for a short period of time, just enough to accumulate the desired number of copies and we move on. And when they're lowly abundant, then the accumulation times are much longer and we count more copies so that we can better estimate the abundance. And as a result of doing this, we end up having highly buffered number of copies counted per protein from uh, different proteins that might have a abundance that vary by four orders of magnitude, we are going to count copies that vary by one order of magnitude. So that's helpful. And let's see how it works with some real data uh, from mass spectrometry and proteomics starting and from also data from a very mature single molecule technology. It is difficult to benchmark the single molecule approaches to proteomics because they're not yet widely applied to, to uh, biological samples, to complex samples. But in this case, as a representative single molecule method, we used uh, uh, Illumina sequencing. It's, it's a fairly wide developed, well developed commercial method. So here we start with this discrepancy in the number of molecules present of proteins and RNAs. And we can look at how many copies are being sampled by mass spectrometry in bulk samples and by sequencing by Illumina again from bulk samples and in single cells. So we see that in all cases with the mass spectrometry proteomics, we are able to, to sample high number of copies. And because of the high number of copies being sampled per sample in this case, it turns out that the cost per molecule being measured with this approach using separation and automatic gain control is actually substantially lower. And again, this is cost per molecule being sampled for, for the analysis. So looking at some of our data for applying mass spectrometry to single mammalian cells and how this stacks up uh, in terms of the estimated copy numbers, we see that for the average uh, protein that is quantified, we sample uh, over 100 copies, which compares quite favorably to the number of copies that we are able to sample by 10x genomics with very deep sequencing applied to the same cells. And that is consistent with obtaining quantification 
obtaining quantification with a relatively low amount of noise coming from counting errors. And similarly, with, with newer methods of mass spectrometry analysis, again, we can see that we can count a large number of copies, many dozens of molecules being sampled per peptide, per protein, and in some cases, uh, tens of thousands. So how can this work? How can this be applied to a single molecule method? Um, we're not sure. I think this is up for brainstorming and for the community to figure out, but we do have a suggestion. So I'm going to offer one scenario that appears plausible to us. It may or may not work, but the idea will be that we use high performance separation when this could be capillary electrophoresis, could be liquid chromatography, could be something else, but we use high performance separation starting with uh, of our sample. So this represents all the molecules that we have in this case, we have only three analytes to make this simple. Uh, some of them are from this red protein that is slowly abundant, and we have a lot of the gray protein. So as we separate it, let's say these are elution peaks, if this is liquid chromatography, then the eluting sample is sampled from regular intervals of time, and then it's diluted to equalize the number of molecules that are going to be counted per interval of time. So that from each of these time intervals, there will be the same number of molecules being counted. And what this results is, uh, in, with this scheme is that you can see that the number of actual molecules counted from the red analyte and from the grain from the green is kind of comparable. So we can get a good estimate for their abundance. And when we take into account the dilution ratios used here, we can computationally reconstitute what was the abundance of those different analytes in the initial sample. Essentially, the idea here being that instead of counting all of the molecules that are present, we want to selectively count smaller fraction of the most abundant proteins, and we want to count larger fraction of the less abundant proteins. And this might allow, potentially, to be able to count a million copies of proteins per sample and still achieve representative coverage of, of a mammalian proteome, perhaps. So I wanted to share some ideas with you. Acknowledge that uh, the brainstorming was done with Mike McCoss and Javier uh, Alfaro, and we've also included uh, uh, lots of good ideas, actually, from, molecule, from colleagues with expertise in the single molecule field, including Edward Marcot and, and many Wanunu, uh, who have joined this Gedanken experiment of thinking how we can potentially uh, scale the the, the, the benefits of single molecule protein sequencing to the really large scale of the human proteome. I think the human proteome is so large that it's not intuitive for us to, to perceive its size. It's almost like the cosmos, like, like galaxies. It's, it's difficult to appreciate how many more protein molecules there are in a cell compared to the RNA molecule. So something that works so well for the transcriptome might be challenging to implement in the same way for the proteome because if we if if the cost per single cell is 30,000 times higher for single cell proteomics and single cell transcriptomics that factor begins to make a difference maybe even for a wealthy company like Merck so i'll stop here uh, with my speculations and i'll invite questions and thoughts uh, brainstorming time for ideas <laughs>